This is episode 86 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, you'll hear about the magic of Charles Dickens. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast, your podcast home for magic history. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 86. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, happy Festivus, and all the related holidays. It's sure been an interesting year, hasn't it? And now that I am uh, doing a better job of keeping up to date with the podcast, I'm uh, going to do my very first ever holiday-themed podcast, so we'll see how it goes. Um, Oh, and before we get into the podcast, let's finish the year off with a contest. I haven't done a contest in a long time. I'm not even sure if I've done a contest uh, in season four, and now it's season five. So um, this should be interesting. So listen close. So recently, uh, Gabe over at uh, Potter Auctions um, and quicker than the eye, also that wonderful website announced a new edition of the book Houdini's Fabulous Magic. And apparently, in there, there's a quote from Teller from Penn and Teller, who wrote, uh, I guess he wrote the foreword. And the quote is I have loved this book for 60 years. Four pieces of the Penn and Teller repertoire were directly inspired by Houdini's fabulous magic. So, the contest question is, can you name those four pieces? And there's a bonus question! Here's the bonus question. What Ricky J routine from his Ricky J and his 52 assistants show came from Houdini's Fabulous Magic. You can answer the first question, or you can answer the bonus question, or you can answer both. And here's how you do it. Send me an email with your answers to info at carnegiemagic.com, and please put contest 2023 in the subject line. Um, like I said, you can answer the, uh, the first question or the second question, the bonus question, either one. And um, I'm going to pick a a winner from among uh, however many we get. And I will announce the winner in the first episode, first podcast episode of 2023. And, of course, the prize, uh, whenever I do this, a prize is always something magic history oriented. So uh, likely going to be some piece of ephemera from a magician of long ago. So there you go. There's our contest. And uh, let me just mention really quick, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and this fella had been into magic for about 40 years at least, and I discovered that he was unaware that Charles Dickens was an amateur magician. And I got to thinking about it, and I thought, well, that's going to be, or this idea, Charles Dickens, would be a perfect subject to cover here at Christmas time. So... Uh, that's what we're doing. Our first ever uh, special Christmas edition of the podcast, and we'll explore the magician Charles Dickens. Our special feature today is on Charles Dickens, the author who was born February 7th, 1812, in Portsmouth, England. Of course, he's famous for his various books and stories and characters. The world of magic, however, um, if you think about it, would be very different had it not been for Charles Dickens because, well, in a manner of speaking, he gave us David Copperfield. Now, of course, he gave us the book, uh, David Copperfield, but um, if it hadn't been for a young boy named David who adopted the name Copperfield, well, the world of magic would be a very different place today. So thank you, uh, David Kotkin, and thank you, Charles Dickens, for that. 
But more than that, Charles Dickens was actually an amateur magician. And as I began my research on this particular episode, I knew um, I, I might be at a short disadvantage because uh, there have been several books written about Dickens and his magical interests, and it just so happens I don't have any of them. Uh, the most recent book was by Ian Keeble, who by all accounts is quite the authority on Charles Dickens. Fortunately, I did find an article written by um, Ian, so that's been very helpful. But there are other places to search for information, newspaper archives, old magic magazine articles, various other magic history books. So I think you're going to enjoy this. Let's start with the, the big question. Where did Charles Dickens develop his interest in magic? Well, according to John Forster, uh, he was the first biographer of Dickens. He said that Charles had been a lifelong fan of of the theater. Beginning as early as age seven, he had a fascination for the theater. That would be in around 1819. And several sources point out that his interest in magic began after witnessing the East Indian juggler Ramo Sammy during a run of Dickens' own work, Nicholas Nickleby, at the Hull Theater in 1838. Now, there was another Indian juggler of some fame who went by the name Kia Khan Cruz, who came to Britain around 1816. There's no record of when Dickens saw him, but he was clearly influenced by his conjuring feats, as we will find out in a little bit. In the book Annals of Conjuring by Sidney Clark, he points out that while in France, Dickens may have witnessed Eugene Bosco performing. Dickens wrote about the incredible performance, but never mentioned the magician by name, rather referring to him as the most consummate master of ledger domain he'd ever seen. And this was in 1854. But by 1854, Dickens had already performed magic for years. So uh, it wasn't Bosco that got him interested in magic. Next, we have Ian Keeble, who I mentioned was uh, an authority on Dickens, who's also a magician as well. And um, he wrote a companion article for his book in The Linking Ring in November of 2014. And in it, he says that Dickens saw Ludwig Dobler at the St. James Theater in London in July of 1842. And this is likely what sparked his interest in magic. Now, Ludwig Dobler had a very clever way of starting his show. He would walk out on stage with a pistol, he'd fire it, and a huge row of candles would instantly illuminate the stage. Lud uh, Ludwig Dobler, by the way, besides being an exceedingly clever magician, was also a cousin to one Johann Nepomuk Hofsenzer. Now, the debut performance of Mr. Charles Dickens, The Conjurer, took place in December of 1842, the occasion, a birthday party for his son, Charlie. He and his friend, Forster, had previously gone to Hamley's, which was a toy store, which also sold conjuring apparatus, and bought the entire lot. He wrote about it to his friend, Professor Felton. Here's the letter. The actuary of the national debt couldn't calculate the number of children who are coming here on the twelfth night in honor of Charlie's birthday, for which occasion I have provided a magic lantern and divers other tremendous engines of that nature. But best of all is that Forster and I have purchased between us the entire stock and trade of a conjurer, the practice and display whereof is entrusted to me. And oh, my eyes, Felton, if you could see me conjuring the company's watches into impossible tea caddies and causing pieces of money to fly and burning pocket handkerchiefs without hurting them and... and and practicing in my own room without anybody to admire, uh, you would never forget it as long as you live. There's another letter to his friend William McCready in regards to another Dickens birthday party performance. It goes like this. On Nina's birthday, Forster and I conjured bravely. A plum pudding was produced from an empty saucepan held over a blazing fire kindled in Stanfield's hat without damage to the lining. A box of bran was changed into a live guinea pig which ran between my godchild's feet and was the cause of such a shrill uproar that you might have heard it over in America. <laughs> 
three half-crown coins taken from Major Burns and put into a tumbler glass before his eyes, and there gave jingling answers to questions asked of them by me, and, well, they knew where you were and what you were doing, to the unspeakable admiration of the whole assembly. Next, we have something really interesting. Apparently, while on vacation with his family on the Isle of Wight, Dickens put on a magical production, but rather than calling himself by his name, he used a version of that Indian juggler's name and called himself Rhea Rama Roos instead of Kia Khan Cruz. In this case, he was the unparalleled necromancer Rhea Rama Roos, educated cabalistically in the orange groves of Salamanca and the ocean caves of Alum Bay. And here is the program that Dickens created for that uh, event. This comes from Genie Magazine, December 1977, though the exact same write-up is in numerous articles on Dickens within Magic uh, Periodicals. It begins with the Leaping Card Wonder, two cards being drawn from the pack by two of the company and placed with the pack in the necromancer's box will leap forth at the command of any lady of not less than 80 years of age. He follows it with, This wonder is the result of nine years' seclusion in the mines of Russia. Okay. Next is the Pyramid Wonder. A shilling being lent to the necromancer by any gentleman of not less than 12 months or more than 100 years of age, and carefully marked by said gentleman, will disappear from within a brazen box at the word of command and pass through the hearts of an infinity of boxes which will afterwards build themselves into pyramids and sink into a small mahogany box at the necromancer's bidding. It's followed with, Five thousand guineas were paid for the acquisition of this wonder to a Chinese Mandarin who died of grief immediately after parting with the secret. Next we have the Conflagration Wonder, a card being drawn from the packet by any lady, not under a direct and positive promise of marriage, will be immediately named by the necromancer, destroyed by fire, and reproduced from his own ashes. An annuity of one thousand pounds has been offered to the necromancer by the directors of the Sunfire office for the secret of this wonder and refused. Next, the loaf of bread. The watch of any truly prepossessing lady of any age, single or married, being locked by the necromancer in a strong box, will fly at the word or command from within that box into the heart of an ordinary loaf of bread, whence it shall be cut out in the presence of the whole company, whose cries of astonishment will be audible at a distance of some miles. Ten years in the plains of Tartary were devoted to the study of this wonder. Next, the Traveling Doll Wonder. The Traveling Doll is composed of solid wood throughout, but by putting on a traveling dress of the simplest construction, becomes invisible, performs enormous journeys in half a minute, and passes from visibility to invisibility with an expedition so astonishing that no eye can follow its transformations. The necromancer's attendant usually faints on beholding this wonder and is only to be revived by the administration of brandy and water. The Pudding Wonder The company, having agreed among themselves to offer to the necromancer by way of loan the hat of any gentleman whose head has arrived at, at maturity of size, the necromancer, without removing that hat for an instant from before the eyes of the delighted company, will light a fire in it, 
Make a plum pudding in his magic saucepan. Boil it over said fire. Produce it in two minutes. Thoroughly done. Cut it and dispense it in portions to the whole company for their consumption. And then and there, returning the hat at last, wholly uninjured by fire, to its lawful owner. The extreme liberality of this wonder awakening the jealousy of the beneficent Austrian government when exhibited in Milan, the necromancer had the honor to be seized and confined for five years in the fortress of that city. Wow. <laughs> That's a... That is maybe the coolest program I have ever heard in my <laughs> in my life. That is, uh, well, the Pudding Wonder is, uh, fam uh, Dickens is famous for the Pudding Wonder. Um, but the I have to mention the Traveling Doll Wonder because this was a popular trick in that time period. And I actually got to see it performed by none other than Ken Klosterman when Ken was uh, still with us and he had his wonderful collection and he brought out uh, this thing. It's actually called uh, The Bonus Genius or The Bonus Genius. And um, it's the most um, unusual looking thing because it doesn't really look like a doll. It looks sort of like a, a roughly carved piece of wood. And then all of a sudden... It uh, disappears right in front of you. It's it's rather uh, uh, ingenious and very primitive all at the same time. Now, there are some articles by non-magicians that I have found that sort of frowned upon the idea of Dickens as a magician and even suggested that he couldn't have been a very good magician because he used, quote, self-working props. Uh, and this idea that apparatus magic works itself can also be found um, uh, can be found among magicians. And I will tell you firsthand, there is nothing more difficult to watch than a magician fumbling and bumbling their way through a routine using props because they assumed that the prop did all the work and they didn't put forth the requisite time and rehearsal needed to develop a smooth performance. Smooth apparatus work requires the same practice as does sleight of hand or manipulation magic or even mentalism for that matter, as they all require you to do something unusual while trying to also perform. There's a letter by a Mrs. Jane Carlyle. The letter is addressed to her family. It dates to December 23rd, 1843. Oddly enough, today happens to be December 23rd as well. The letter goes like this. Dickens and Forster, above all, exerted themselves to the perspiration was pouring down and they seemed drunk with their efforts. Only think of that excellent Dickens playing the conjurer for one whole hour the best conjurer I ever saw, and I have paid money to see several. I think that says it all. Dickens would see a lot of famous magicians in his day, and contrary to previous belief, he would write about them. Now, he doesn't write about them in his books, but rather in articles in his periodical uh, called Household Words, and one other one whose name I forgot to write down. Uh, anyway, he wrote about Robert Houdin, John Henry Anderson, Colonel Stoddard, and more. He was well-versed in the world of The Conjurer. Now, I'd like to point out that there is an unusual movie that's called The Invisible Woman. It stars Ray Fiennes. And no, it's not about, it's not the old sci-fi Invisible Man story starring a woman. It, 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 Ray Fiennes plays Charles Dickens, and it has to do with a woman that Dickens fell in love with later in his life. And what I love about this particular movie, first off, Ray Fiennes looks just like Charles Dickens. It's incredible. But what I love is he actually does some performances in the movie. However, what threw me when I watched it was he's not doing magic, but he's giving hypnosis demonstrations. 
Well, uh, that turns out to be historically accurate. You see, later in life, Dickens learned what was then called mesmerism, or animal magnetism. This was a precursor to hypnotism. And he would give demonstrations for entertainment purposes, and on occasion would also use it or attempt to use it on people for therapeutic purposes. Charles Dickens was certainly one of us in regards to his enjoyment of magic. But he was one of the greats in regards to literature and storytelling. And I've read that Dickens is credited with saving Christmas. In fact, one article said that his story, A Christmas Carol, was a bit of a a wake-up call to Victorian Londoners. And I would dare say that it's still a wake-up call to many would-be Scrooges of the world. The story is filled with its own sort of magic and... It's one of the greatest festive stories ever written. It wasn't the only story, by the way, that Dickens wrote that had ghosts in it. If you're wondering, uh, Dickens certainly was alive during the rise of spiritualism, but he was also one of the early debunkers of the phenomenon, and yet still, ghosts figured prominently in some of his stories. Clearly, for Dickens, ghosts are real, mediums are not. Charles Dickens lived to be the ripe old age of 58, which is not old at all. He died June 9, 1870. Now, here's an interesting twist that happened after Dickens died. He passed away before completing his book, The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Well, from the book Psychic Oddities by Harold Carrington, he says, quote, Few know that a relatively illiterate medium living in Brattleboro, Vermont, T.P. James by name, claimed to have completed the book under the direct guidance of the spirit of Dickens who dictated the rest of the book to him. And what is wilder, that edition was actually published in 18. 1874, and some people actually believe the finished book was indeed done by the spirit of Charles Dickens, but John Forster, the friend and biographer of Dickens, claimed to have found notes regarding a pivotal scene in the book, and the notes were handwritten by Dickens himself, and none of that content had found its way in the spirit version of the book, so it appears that old Charles did not finish his book after all. Now, my friends, before I go on, I need to say a huge thank you to AskAlexander.com and specifically to librarian Olino Zuzulovich. I ran into a glitch today while using Ask Alexander, and without her assistance, there would be no podcast episode today. All the Magic Magazine references... Uh, that I used for the information for this particular episode. I found them using Ask Alexander. And again, without her help, there would be nothing. So thank you again, Olina. And just so you know, the episode is not over. Um, I had originally planned to do an audio drama, an audio uh, dramatic reading, I guess you'd say, of A Christmas Carol. And I have uh, been working on that now for the last hour, and um, it's going to take way too long, I'm afraid. I wanted to I wanted to have this podcast up here very shortly, and um, it's going to take me a couple hours to do A Christmas Carol, so I think that I'm going to skip that. But I have a backup plan, and that is this. Uh, while I was doing the research on Dickens, I came across... A uh, December 1959 linking ring issue with a story in it called The Magician's Christmas Eve, an original story by Houdini. Now, this was a story that originally appeared in, let me see here, it originally appeared in the Vaudeville News. Uh, December 23rd, 1921, so this very day in 1921. 
and Larry Weeks had uncovered it. And so now, uh, from the Vaudeville News, I am going to read you that story that appeared um, oh so many years ago on December 23rd in 1921, a clever Christmas story by Houdini. And here we go. Little Olive was seven years of age. Nothing unusual for a girl to be of that age, at least once in her lifetime. She had just commenced to do a little thinking on her own. Her father, Robert Byron, had been an expert dancer on the stage, and his name was a name well known to patrons of the theaters. Two years ago, he had passed to the great majority— having been carried away by that fell disease that so many of the famous dancers become afflicted with, the great white plague, consumption. The sinister clouds of dust which Byron had raised and inhaled by beating a rap-tap with his feet on the stage floor in countless performances of the Lancashire clog had demanded their toll. Theatrical records show that many clog dancers, stronger than Byron, were not immune. No wonder, then, that the Lancashire is called the Clog Dancer's Funeral March. Poor little Olive was to have no Christmas box. Her mother, a dainty little woman, had sketched with Byron, but at his demise, not having any inclination to follow the stage, she settled down, and with a little means at her command, opened a small sweet shop near a public school. The fates had not been any too kind to her. The school children were all saving for Christmas boxes, and the little widow's face drooped more and more each day. But at Christmas, she was going to give her little olive a treat, to take her to the theater and allow her to enjoy a special Christmas bill at one of the big-time vaudeville theaters. The little widow had been given seats by Old Pierce, who, in his prime, had won several contests for step dancing. In his old age, he had gradually been drifting away from the footlights until now he had graduated to a position of stage door keeper and general utility advertiser. Old Pierce, in his more prosperous years, had toured with the world with the famous Keller, the magician. He went into business for himself with disastrous results. Everybody knows that actors are notably poor businessmen. Edwin Booth lost a million dollars in the Booth theaters, and there is in existence a letter in which he tells how he lost his money. It is also history, and Genest makes mention of the fact in his history of the English stage, that Denville, the great actor, eventually became a ticket-taker at the Drury Lane Theatre. Others who traveled similar paths were Signor Marsh of the Marsh Troupe, Harry Hogan, a member of the Booth Theatre, and A. E. Marshall, who, by the way, had the biggest benefit ever held up to that time in 1854 at Castle Garden, the very place made famous by Jenny Lynn concerts. So you see, although Pierce was a backdoor man, he traveled in good company. He had managed to give himself two tickets, and remembering his old friend's widow, he walked in one day, dropped the two tickets on the counter, mumbled a few words, and passed along without waiting for any thanks. Robert Byron had been dead two years, but somehow or other, little Olive could not get it into her head that her dear dad would never come back. She knew dad had gone to heaven because her mother had told her so, and her mother, she also knew, never, never told stories. Christmas Day arrived. The little widow put Olive into a nice clean dress, the last one her bob had bought, and to the theater they went. It was the first place of amusement that she had visited since her husband's death. She heard, as in a dream, the overture. The leader, with the majestic mane, was waving his ivory baton. The orchestra were playing a potpourri. Among the various melodies, she recognized, with aching heart, the Lancashire clog, 
It was so well known to her as her Bob had used it in his opening dance. Little Olive, hearing a sob, looked at her mother and wondered why the tears were trickling down her face. But with a curious look in her eyes, she said to her mother, Mama, isn't that Daddy's music they're playing? No, pet, it's not. They are simply playing well-known airs, and it's just a... Just sounds familiar to you. Olive was silent. The show having started, she was soon busy watching the various scenes. The audience screamed with laughter at the sidewalk sallies of the famous comedians. They applauded the singing number of his well groomed partner. Amid an outburst of approval, the players made their exit and gave way to the next number, the celebrated necromancer known to the public as. The Marvelous Balsoma. This wonderful man, according to the press agent, was the greatest magician that had lived in this or any other age, and his greatest feat was to produce toys and bonbons from thin air and from a borrowed silk hat, which he had never seen before. He was in great demand at vaudeville theaters, having a wonderful manner in pleasing children and presenting them with various toys he produced as if by magic. With eyes and mouth wide open, Olive saw him produce rabbits from a handkerchief, huge bunches of flowers from an empty cone, and for a concluding mystery, he had at a large, a very large wooden cabinet rolled onto the stage, and after showing the audience it was perfectly empty, he produced one after the other, three lovely ladies dressed in tights and representing the three graces. A nod to the leader who struck up a waltz, the three graces went through a well-drilled dance, then gradually went back into the cabinet, when, to all intents and purposes, they vanished. The music had almost died out, when, with a grandiloquent air, Balsoma walked to the footlights and very slowly said, "'Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to inform you that it is possible with the aid of my little cabinet to produce any celebrity you may wish to see, not in the spirit form, but in flesh and blood, living and breathing. For instance, may I suggest such names as George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, General Grant. With the aid of the cabinet, they will come from the beyond and say a few words to you. Might I suggest that someone call up? Hmm, who would they like to see? Amid the confusion of names, that that of Abraham Lincoln was heard, high above the rest of the voices. We don't say that it was an accomplice who called the name, but nevertheless, Balsoma announced, We will have Abraham Lincoln. He drew the curtains of the cabinet, and in about five seconds, Abraham Lincoln came forth. Balsoma had a trap door in the stage and two change artists, Mr. and Mrs. Samsony. They had their wigs arranged in the dressing room under the stage where they heard the names called out aloud, and while one was dressing for a male name, the lady would get ready for some celebrated member of the gentler sex. General Grant appeared with a cigar in his mouth after Lincoln had bowed out and, as usual, said in his slow, hesitating voice, We will fight this out on these lines, if it takes all summer. General Grant had no sooner vanished into the cabinet when little Olive, who believed everything she saw was real, arose in her seat, her little heart beating, and in a tremulous voice cried out, Oh, Mr. Magician, please have Daddy come from the Wonder House and dance for Mama and I like he used to. Please, 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 I know he will come if you tell him that his pity Olive wants to see him. The effect was startling. The little girl standing on her seat, the sobbing woman at her side, dressed in widow's weeds, revealed all too plainly the sad story of the fatherless child and the widow, the mother, overcome with grief, bowed her head and wept bitterly. Daddy's name is Mr. Robert Byron, went on poor little Olive. Please send for him. He has gone to heaven. The tears 
and sobs of the mother caused many a heart to throb with sorrow. Balsoma, the magician, with a startled look on his face, walked down the staircase into the audience. He reached mother and child. Then, taking little Olive in his arms, he carried her to the stage and informed the audience that she was the child of, of his old friend, Robert Byron, and that he had been looking for the widow and child ever since the death of his dear old pal. There was scarcely a dry eye among the audience as Balsoma kissed the weeping little girl. She twined her arms around his neck, appealingly murmuring, "'Bring back my daddy, please.' The curtain came down, Balsoma being the closing act, and the silent audience wended their way out wonderingly. A full year had passed. We will take our readers into a comfortably furnished apartment in Gramercy Park. We see little Olive and her mother, both looking bright and cheerful. The widow's weeds have been discarded. A man enters, his face and form familiar. It is the marvelous Balsoma, known in private life as Curtis Bronson. In his arms he carries a huge bundle of toys. On his face he carries a smile, one that won't come off. He throws the toys and packages on the table, rushes to Olive, picks her up, kisses her, replaces her on the floor, walks over to the little widow, and embraces her as if he meant it. What does all this mean? Has he, has he any right to do this? Well, rather, for the theatrical papers of a previous week carried a paragraph which read, Married, December 20th by the Reverend W. Atkinson, at the little church around the corner. Curtis Bronson, professionally known as the Marvelous Bolsoma, the allusionist to Mrs. Wilfred Byron, knee Collings, widow of the late Robert Byron. And that, my friends, is the story A Magician's Christmas Eve by Harry Houdini, originally appearing in the uh, newspaper, the Vaudeville News, December 23rd, 1921. And that's going to do it for this episode, this Christmas episode of Magic Detective Podcast. I do hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please like the episode in whatever way your podcasting provider will allow. And I will see you one more time next week. Uh, before the year's up with one more podcast. Until then, I'm Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. Be well, stay safe, and a very Merry Christmas. <laughs>